Hey everybody, thank you for joining this episode of the Banking on Experience podcast. Today we are joined by the VP of Digital Marketing and Strategy at Clearview Federal Credit Union, Bill Snyder. Welcome to the show, Bill. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. Super excited to have you, and I'm really excited about this topic. Today we're going to be talking about your digital strategy shouldn't be siloed. That has a lot of definitions across the board, so we're going to help define it today. Bill is a mastermind around this stuff, so I can't wait to talk about it. Before we do that, what's your favorite sports team, Bill? Uh, my favorite sports team. Well, you know, uh, Clearview is based in Pittsburgh, so we have the uh, luxury of having some great sports teams. A couple that might be not so great, but uh, my favorite sports team um, would have to be the Pirates, um, although they've broken my heart uh, several times. But uh, as a kid, uh, my dad and I used to always go to a bunch of games. I take my kids every year. Um, Unfortunately, they haven't had a lot of winning ways in the past couple of years. And when they've had, they've broken my heart. But uh, I think it's because of going with my dad as a kid um, and, and in the summertime, not having anything to do and turning on the radio and TV and being able to listen and watch them. That's my still my favorite team, despite uh, some of their trials and uh, tribulations over the years. I, well, I can I can definitely relate to the trials and tribulations of a sports team breaking your heart. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I'm, going, I'm going to date myself, but I still can't watch the uh, 1992 National League playoffs without uh, tearing up as the Braves beat the Pirates. So it's been a long time, but I still uh, I still can't do it. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I can't I I can't do I can't do it either when I watch the Utah Jazz against the Bulls. <laughs> I mean, I was there and it was just heartbreaking. <laughs> oh man, talk about breaking an entire state's. <laughs> yep. Yep. Anyway, look, I also want to know, where's your favorite vacation spot? My favorite vacation spot. Uh, my family and I like to go to uh, Kelly's Island. Uh, Kelly's Island is a little island uh, outside of uh, Sandusky, uh, where uh, Cedar Point is at in Lake Erie. Uh, you can only get there if you uh, take a ferry over. Uh, it has a uh, very spotty, if any, Wi-Fi connection. Uh, it has uh, no cable TV and not much to do. Uh, and so it's a great place to just sort of unwind. Uh, not a great place to try to check your email if you're trying to catch up on work, but uh, a great place to unwind, a, gr a very laid back attitude, uh, a place where you can let your kids drive a golf cart and you don't, you don't have to worry about a car hitting them. Uh, so we like to go there. Um, we don't get there quite as often as, as, as we used to, but um, it's a cool place to go. It's again, sort of off the grid. Uh, it's, you can see the mainland. You can uh, see different islands in Lake Erie, but unless you have a boat or have a ferry, once you're there, you're, you're there. So it's kind of a cool place just to get away for a while. Mm, I love places like that. Yeah. So Bill, let's come back to the topic. We're going to talk about digital strategy being siloed. Why are you so passionate about this topic? <laughs> yeah, you know, digital strategy and digital in general, I think folks still think about it and talk about it as a uh, its own entity, right? Its own line of business, its own way of doing things. And it really isn't. I mean, we live in a society now where um, digital permeates everything we do. Um, you go to a restaurant now, especially over the past year, you're going to pull up your menu using your phone and a QR code. If you're going to stay home, you're going to order your food on an app, uh, or you might use a separate app to have somebody bring it to you who then uses their own app to pick it up. Um, <laughs> and so it really just integrates everything, right? Um, and it's important. So when I hear, you know, wherever, be it in this organization, other organizations I've been at, or just out and about, people think of it as its own thing. It really isn't. You really can't segment um doing things online or doing things on your phone or just doing things in this new way, which really isn't all that new, but you really can't stop that and, and break it apart from everything that you do in the physical work world because they just combine together. Um, and when you look at it in that lens of only this group or only this people can do this one thing, I think you miss the bigger picture and you wind up having to just do a lot of rework and try to figure out how to get stuff to work later when you can just do it now. I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, the physical aspect of how we create experiences as businesses with consumers um, and specifically with credit unions and their members is both a physical 
and a digital experience. Mm -hmm. You don't get one without the other ever. Yep. Uh, because nine times out of 10, there are touches that happen from a digital perspective to drive them either to the branch or vice versa. After they leave the branch, there's digital touches that happen post their branch visit. So I think I love this because I think that there's a lot of people in this space, especially that think about it in a siloed way. They think digital needs to be its own thing. Somebody needs to own that. And really, it's incorporated into really marketing strategy, which is why I love your title. <laughs> it makes perfect sense because everything that yeah. you do from a marketing perspective has those touches. So let's talk a little bit about how you think things have gone away from that. Like why yeah. has it gone so low to begin with? Yeah. So I think it has to do with just how organizations grew up, right? Um, a lot of organizations um, have been around for a while, right? And they predate digital or what that is, right? They were grown, especially, you know, many credit unions were started in the break room or the lunch room or the basement or garage of a, another organization for folks that worked somewhere, right? And so that predates in many cases, the ability to do things online. Or, and so it was a very brick and mortar focused sort of approach. And as things have evolved, sometimes that thinking hasn't evolved alongside of it, right? So I think if you go through the journey, you know, of things like credit cards and ATMs and those things being added, I think those things probably also grew up in a silo um, and over time have become integrated. Um, digital, if you look at the big scope of things, it's still fairly new. And I still think a lot of organizations are trying to figure out where it goes, but just the growth of what's happening, how fast things change, um, it, it really just, just have to be incorporated. I mean, I was reading a story the other day and it's kind of hard to believe, but you know, the first iPhone I think came out in 2007, which seems like a long time ago, but really isn't. Um, it's only 14 years ago that we've had this thing that has really driven how much, a, a big part of this change. And so I think folks are still trying to figure that out. One of the reasons why I have my title and sort of why I'm here and how we've reorganized is I think that we've sort of come to understand that it is part of everything that we do. And you can't just break it. There's not a clear dividing line. As you said earlier, marketing, you know, used to be just, we'll send some postcards and put up a billboard and run a TV ad and they'll come into a branch and everything will be great. Well, that's just not how it works anymore. Um, all those yeah. things are driving people to a website, which in turn then drives them somewhere else. Or maybe you do want them to come into a, to a location, but you want to track them as they're coming in and you want to see where they're, seeing your ads and things like that. So it does continue to, to combine. And what I tell my folks on my team, other folks here, is that it's, it's just going to keep on going. Uh, the more systems we have, the more platforms that we have, the more they're going to continue to talk together and work to, and have to work together. And so if those platforms and systems have to work together, we have to figure out as employees and staff and people how to work together uh, because it does all combine together to get to that ultimate goal of serving, uh, serving the folks that belong, belong to Clearview. I, I love it, Bill, because, you know, so much of what you just said, I think, resonates so much with my experience from a marketing perspective, too. I mean, I, I'm a marketer. That's that's where my career growth has been. And um, I can't tell you how many times that there's been a struggle at not just like in, in the financial uh, services industry, but like all over the entire world <laughs> and in every industry, there is a struggle with figuring out how to build a cohesive experience that exists mm -hmm. not just digitally, but physically as well and build that cross channel. And you know, you know this from the days that we were working together a little bit uh, <laughs> in, in customer experience, like yep. they're, they're about micro journeys. And you mentioned this, like specific products, like a credit card, offering and specific products like mortgage and all of that are little micro journeys in the yep. broader scope of what we're trying to do for the member right yep. and i would love for you to talk about what do you think are a few things that financial institutions need to stop doing today to ensure that there is a future of a non-silo digital strategy it's a great question. So the one of the thing that, things that we have started to do, um, and I think it started to help, is to really do um, journey maps of the experience that someone is going through. 
Um, and that can be using some software. It can be the old school way that I used to do it with, with post-it notes. Um, but really once you understand all the touch points and really how many options somebody has, it starts to get people thinking, oh, oh yes, this is bigger than just me, or this is just bigger than my team. And then you get the people that are associated with those touch points and you go, oh yes, you're right. I, you, in my case, this my team that sends emails, you can't send, I can't send an email if you don't give me the information to put in that email. And it, it starts to, people sort of start to understand that and go, oh yes, right, this does it would require us to work together. Um, and we've started to do that more and more um, to get the people together. Um, it does require commitment because you have to stay with it and you have to get everybody in a virtual room or in the same room, hopefully sometime soon, but in the, that virtual room. And it takes a while to schedule those folks uh, to find time on their calendars. But when you walk through that process and you sort of go down the happy path and then you realize there's a bunch of unhappy paths um, that you have to fix and talk about, I think that helps to really get that point across to folks that this is not just a one one department or one team or one platform that folks touch. They really touch a lot of things. And when you start doing that across the organization for both those things that are out front and touch a member and then those things that are purely back office for, for staff, it's pretty impactful and it can, I think, really drive some change. So we just started doing that. Um, but even the, just the beginning phases that we've done, I think people have gotten the idea um, and, and we've begun to make some changes to, to make the process more efficient. I love the journey mapping. Um, that's like one of my favorite things in marketing. <laughs> it's so overlooked and it's so powerful. I mean, if you really yep. think about it, uh, even taking it as far as like bringing a high level and showing like the full cycle, once marketing does their journey mapping with every specific product, there's also a handoff point to sales, right? And then mm -hmm. sales has that specific journey. And then there's a handoff for them to service the product yep. with service. Yep. And it's, it's just not done enough. I think that you can, you can spend a good amount of time going over that at a strategic level with very specific people in the room and build that out. And that, can be one of the biggest wins that you have that has the biggest impact on an organization is when people really truly understand, all right, this email that I'm doing is gonna generate 12 leads for the month. What's the process that sales then takes for it? And do they understand the email? Do they know what's right. happening? Yep. I think all of that plays a role in this, in this digital strategy. And so I love the fact that you brought up those journeys because <laughs> I, I can't stress enough how much I feel like people need to spend time there. Um, good old Annette Franz would be happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> These are the journey mapping queen. So um, yeah. let's, let's, move, let's move on to the next question that I have for you, which is what do you think is marketing's biggest challenge in shifting internal buy-off? So I think that, um, you know, as – but one of my big challenges, my, my team's challenges, right? You know, it's not as easy as um, the good old days, right? When you would put a billboard on and a sign out front and turn on the lights and people just came in, right? Uh, people have a lot of choices. Uh, and from a marketing perspective, they have a ton of options. Um, and so it's making sure that we are talking to them in each of those channels and going back to the journey, making sure we understand those channels and how, you know, th th what we're offering as a solution from a credit card or a mortgage, it's different than a t-shirt um, or a pair of jeans, which I used to sell in a previous life. Uh, it's a bigger commitment and you have to understand that and know that that journey is gonna take a little bit longer. Uh, and so sometimes it does take folks a, a while to understand. And I've had these conversations of, yes, we can run ads in multiple channels, um, but we have to hit people over the head a couple of times with the same message or, or close to the same message before they're finally gonna commit um, because nobody, you know, really wakes up in the morning and says, I'm, you know, the first auto loan ad I see today, I'm going to apply for a loan. That's not how it works. Um, so you have to sort of get out in front of people so that when they have that need, they know that you're there. Um, and so sometimes, and I, and I get frustrated with this too, that makes it hard from a conversion perspective or, or a ROI perspective, because those journeys take a while. If you're going to buy a car, get a mortgage, that's a pretty big commitment. Um, and it takes a while to, to sometimes get that person to that end, that end goal. Um, so it's making sure that we have that data to walk people internally through and say, 
trust me, this is the right, this is the right path for us to take. Uh, and so, yes, we're going to have this message and we're going to talk about it in an email and on social and display ads and a commercial and the radio and a billboard and all these things. And it's, and that still might not be enough, but it'll pay off. Just stick with me. Um, and we've seen some of that, but it does take a while. And I think sometimes folks, we live in an immediate world, right? Um, we want everything right now. And sometimes in this industry, the sector, it takes a little while to get those results. Um, so that's been a challenge. But again, if you have the data, if you have the, the, the journey map and say, look how long this map takes and look at all these touch points that somebody has, um, that, that, that helps getting that internal buy off. Yeah, the preference for, you know, what they want with an omni-channel or multi-channel experience is, is so important, you know, and we dealt with this, I've talked about this so much in, on the podcast, but I'll bring it up again, like during the pandemic, we switched from a huge bank to a credit union here in Utah, and um, the primary method of communication that I had at that time was text. Like I couldn't get on a phone call during their <laughs> business hours. And really they switched my entire banking from Chase to a very specific credit union here in Utah. Yep. And it worked fabulously, like all through text. And yep. if that wouldn't have happened, totally honest. I wouldn't have switched. Like. If they couldn't make that happen, I, there was just no way that I could have carved out the time at the time to do that. And plus, you know, branches weren't even open. So right, right. That's, that's just a small example of how sometimes it's also understanding the customer enough or the member enough to know, hey, look, focus on this channel because this is their preference. And we see this all the time. Bill, you see this all the time with your members. The younger the audience, what communication channels do they want? It's because it's different than the yeah. older, right? Yep. How to be able to establish that that uniqueness of them having a preference of the channels that you communicate with them with too. So yeah, I mean you have to, like you said, you have to have that balance, right? And you have to make and you can't let. Sometimes I think of it as spinning plates, right? You can't let any of them fall down. Um, you might have to give somebody a different spinning plate. That's their preference, right? So somebody might want the red one versus the blue one, but you have to make sure they all continue to spin. Um, and so you have to make sure that the physical locations are ready and have everything they need, but you have to make sure that your online banking, your app, uh, we introduced uh, video banking during the uh, pandemic. So the ability to sort of like, we're having this conversation now, the ability to have all, to do all your banking face to face, but yet apart. Um, and you have to make sure that you can conduct everything basically outside of a cash transaction in any, in any of those channels. Um, and that can be a challenge sometimes, but you're right. You know, you, you have to meet people where they're at. Um, and especially over the past year where it's just, everything has just been so different. Um, you have to be able to, to have, to allow someone to, to bank with you, um, from their car or from their house or, um, on a, a, a phone or on their desktop, or if they do want to come into a physical location to make sure they can schedule an appointment so that you don't have too many people in the same place and you have to make sure you have all these things. So it can be a challenge, um, but I think it's a, it's a good challenge uh, to have, to be able to introduce some more of those channels and also figure out what's next to make sure that, um, cause there's always something next to make sure that we, we have that and stay ahead of people. So one of the things that, um, you know, we've talked about uh, just offline um, <laughs> I've known Bill for a long time, by the way, for the audience. So. <laughs> uh, but one of the things we've talked offline is like, you know, the, the role that technology plays in all this, you know, it can be a major hindrance or it could be the <laughs> best thing that ever happened. Yep. So how do you balance the, dif the difference? I think, yeah, it, you know, not only here, but in previous places I've been as well, uh, you have to make sure that you have the, the, the right process. And I think that's the big thing. Um, if your process is broken, if it's outdated, if it's too many steps, the right that adding new technology to that isn't going to solve the problem. Um, so it's talking of, so I think it's first understanding what that process is, seeing how you can simplify it, make it more convenient, um, either for a member or internally, and then finding the technology that beats that process. Um, I've seen not so much here, but definitely in previous uh, lives, you know, just taking a new system, a new platform and slapping it on top of an old process 
and then seeing people upset because this new technology surprisingly does the same thing as the old technology. Um, wow. This looks prettier. That, that's not the right answer. Uh, so it's making sure that you can fill those gaps in um, to make sure that um, that it does meet folks' needs. And I think that's where the, the, the trouble comes in, right? It's not always the flashiest thing. Um, it's not always on the cutting edge, although I'd love to be on the cutting edge and get the flashiest thing. It's making sure that you get the right platform, the right tool, the right feature, the right functions that that solve a process problem that we're having um, and make it easier. So I talk about, you know, so appointment scheduling, right? That was an issue we had, right? We didn't want people to have to call and then have our financial centers, our branches figure out where to store that information. So we found the, you know, we did online appointment scheduling, found a tool that worked. Uh, video banking was the same thing. Like you said, our branches were closed or they were had scaled down hours. How do you have that face-to-face -face communication? And in some of those instances, we had to tweak the process a little bit. It might've been a little bit outdated. So um, I think process is key. And then you find the right platform on top of it. Uh, when I have vendors call me or send me emails and their email starts with, uh, or, their, or their phone conversation starts with, look how flashy and great this is. And they don't really talk about the problem they're gonna solve it's a pretty quick phone call or pretty, or the email is pretty short back to them because you sort of know that they just want to sell the flash um, yeah. and, and not what they're, you know, not really solve a problem. Yeah. I think that's really key. Focusing on the pain that the technology is actually going to help solve. And then does the technology make the life of those that are using it more simple? I think mm -hmm. that's also key. Yep. But I also, think there's, one, there's another area that I wanted to add to what you said, and that's, getting the adoption of, of the people behind the technology to buy into it. And you've got to have that. And that I think ties right into your process where they, everyone that uses it, the users of the product, they need to know that it's going to be valuable for them. And if you don't have that process built out where it's adopted by them, no matter how great of a process you have at a high level, it will fail because you won't have the people that's, that's needed, that's doing their day to day and that needs that technology to make life more simple. Like imagine if there wasn't a pandemic and video banking wasn't a thing, right? It wasn't like almost required to have. Imagine like trying to get your entire team to adopt video banking mm -hmm. just off of a whim. It would have to have solved a problem that is specific to the pain that they really are having. And I think that the pandemic in some ways had, had forced a lot of financial institutions to do exactly what you guys did was move to a video platform because it was helping solve a pain, move to scheduling because it was helping solve a pain. Yep. And that is something that I think we're going to see more and more of the consumers, members and customers of, of organizations are going to require more from businesses. They're going to require the experience to be easy. They're going to require the experience to be seamless. To, to not have gaps in the process that if they if they purchase something from them, they need to make sure that it's delivered and serviced. And I think we're gonna see that shift happen more and more. Um, we've, we've seen it happen over the pandemic and I think we're gonna continue to see it happen even more in the future. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you. I think it also internally, you have to admit where there's gaps or where there's pain points. And sometimes that's, difficult, right? Some, every, every, I think everybody wants to think that they're doing everything well. Uh, so you have to admit that, th that there could be a gap. You have to listen to folks both internally as, as, as well as um, customers to, to, to get that feedback and go, yep, you're right. There's something here that we have to fix. And I think once you take that leap and admit that you have to do it, it definitely makes it easier to then fix that process, get that new system or platform that's going to help, help solve the problem. So Bill, we're at time. Let's recap really quick. We've talked about digital strategy, how it shouldn't be siloed. One of the ways that we've talked about how you can solve that is journey mapping. The outcome of journey mapping for the record can be building the right process, <laughs> which you, you mentioned. And part of building that right process is ensuring that technology solves pain and doesn't just become an added thing to the process that's going to create more problem. Bill, where can people reach you if they want to talk deeper about this? Yeah, I would love to talk to folks about this. Uh, you know, in my spare time, I dabble in this outside of my everyday job. So uh, uh, LinkedIn is a great way to get a hold of me. 
Um, you can also go to uh, the Clearview site. We have a contact us page. You can always uh, find me on there as well. Um, but one of those two ways, and I'll be happy to to get back to you. We can set up time to talk uh, or in, in, in person, but uh, online or over the phone uh, would be a great way to, yeah, to chat about these topics. Bill, it was a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate uh, talking to you today. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. Um, please subscribe to the podcast. If you have anything that you want to hear about that we aren't doing today, there is a link on the landing page that you can go request a net new topic and we'd be happy to make it happen. So let us know if you have any questions and reach out to me specifically if you would like to see a change. Thanks again.